Okay, it looks like everyone's here. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Eh? So I know lots of them actually coming from afar, just arrived uh, last night. I hope you have a wonderful sleep. And today is an absolutely beautiful day, you see, yeah? and also a beautiful place. Uh, we're actually in a place which is called uh, Westward Look Resort. Right? When we first choose this place, we actually didn't realize this place actually has uh, some Buddhist connections, right? So by simply saying westward look, right? I think it mentioned <laughs> a very, <laughs> yeah, very important allusion to a place which is sacred for all Chinese Buddhists, right? Which is the West, right? Of course, the West here for the Chinese Buddhists, it means India, right? Because that's the place Buddhist teaching, right, came from and also where the Buddhist canon right, came from, right? So here we're now in the Westward Look Resort, right? Probably still looking towards the West, but right now we're sitting in the West, right? The Europeans used to refer to other parts of the world according to their perspective, refer to China, Japan as the Far East. But from the Chinese perspective, right? Indian is the Near West. Right. Europe is the far west, <laughs> and the United States is far, far west. <laughs> right. So I think this place is really an auspicious place, right? So in such a wonderful place, such an auspicious place, it's my great pleasure to announce the opening of the first international conference of the Chinese Buddhist canon, which is entitled Spreading Buddhist Words in China, the formation and the transformation of the Chinese Buddhist canon. So this conference has been sponsored by American Council of Learning Societies and financially supported by the Jiang Jingguo Foundation based in Taiwan. We also receive support from College of Humanities and also uh, the School of International Language literature and cultures, and the, of course, the Department of East Asian Studies. Right? And today we have guests from Europe, mainland China, Taiwan, of course, United States and Canada. We gather together to study all the aspects of Chinese Buddhist canon. Right? And among our guests, we have some distinguished guests, and we have friends from uh, Chinese Council General of People's Republic China, in Los Angeles, and uh, Mr. Chiu Shaofang, His Excellency, uh, here, the uh, Council General, and uh, also Mr. Mao Yizong, right, Vice Council from the Council General, uh, uh, to represent the University of Arizona and the College of, College of Humanity. We have uh, Mary uh, Widener Bassett, right, the Dean of the College of Humanities. Right, uh, Alan Philippe Durand, right. Director of the School of International Language, Culture, Literature and Culture, right? We call it the SILK, right? right. And also uh, Philippe Gabriel, Department Head of East Asian Studies. Right. We also have uh, Robert Gimello, an old member in the department and also former head of Department of East Asian Studies. We still count him as part of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also from uh, uh, other places uh, of the world, we have uh, Louis Lancaster, right? Professor Louis Lancaster, uh, Professor Emeritus of the University of California at Berkeley, Director of Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative, and also the former President of the U University of the West. And uh, other guests including Right. Aming Du, right. professor and the vice president from Dhamma Drum Buddhist College and the Chinese Buddhist Electronic Text Association, the so-called Sibeta, here, yeah. Professor Aming Du. Right. And uh, Professor He Mei, right. researcher from Institute of Study of World Religions, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Right. And uh, Professor Chen Zhichao, right. uh, also researcher right, of Institute of uh, Historical Study, 
also Beijing Normal University. He, he is a grandson of the renowned historian Chen Yuan. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, in this opening session, we have three speakers. Uh, first, I want to invite Mary Whitener Bassett to represent the college to deliver a speech. Please, Mary. Well, thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chu, colleagues from far and near, and of course, all of our honored guests. It is my privilege to serve as the Dean of the College of Humanities. And in that role, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the College of Humanities. As you join us here in Tucson for this very first, and I hope first in a series of many, international conferences about the formation and transformation of the Brutus Canon. The wonderful listing we've partially just heard of the keynote address and wonderful panel contributions, all by such well-known scholars in this broad and very interdisciplinary field, which I'm just learning a little bit about today, promises to offer an exciting expansion of the scholarly conversations about the history, development, and intercultural influences on the variations of understanding and purposes of the Buddhist canon. I've been asked also to talk a little bit about the departmental history, which was fun to learn about as we prepared for this. The Department of East Asian Studies, was previously known as the Department of Oriental Studies, was founded in 1968 here at the University of Arizona. The department was started as a program headed by Charles Hucker in 1955 as a program before it became a department. And um, he was asked then to chair an Oriental Studies Committee from which became then the department and eventually the East Asian Studies, the renamed department. Due to Hucker's efforts, the program received funding several times from the Carnegie Corporation uh, and at one time received a $100,000 uh, grant in 1960, which at that time, as we all know, was a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> Today, it still feels like a lot of money. After Hucker left for the University of Michigan in 1961, the then president of the Association of Asian Studies, uh, Earl Hampton Pritchard, succeeded him as chair of Oriental Studies of that committee in uh, 1962. Then in 1968, the department was founded and offered, and still does offer, the BA, MA, and PhD degrees. The position of department head was succeeded by William Schultz, Andrew Onate, Rob Jamello, Brian McKnight, Tim Vance, and now, of course, Phil Grapeville. We in the College of Humanities are proud to offer as much support as possible for this fine and creative set of initiatives for this department and all of that has brought you together today. I am grateful to Wu Shang the, and the other contributing members of our fine Department of East Asian Studies and all the faculty, students, and staff members of East Asian Studies the School of International Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, the SILK for us, which, and of related programs who have made this con conference possible. You heard the contributors earlier. I would like to close by wishing you all a very productive and enjoyable time here together and offer you all my thanks for your contributions and wishes for a great conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Chu Xiaofeng, Council General. He has served in Ministry of Foreign Affairs for many years. His recent appointments include from 2004 to 2008, the Council General at the advanced rank to Sydney, Australia. From 2008 to 2010, as Ambassador Extraordinary of People's Republic of China to Sierra Leone. And from 2010, he has been appointed as a Consul General at Ambassador Rank of People's Republic of China to, at Los Angeles. Now, please welcome His Excellency, Mr. Chu. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Dr. Wu, and also professors, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak here. You know, because I never such attend such this uh, conference before, 
this is my first time to attend the conference. But also it's a pity because I don't have enough time to join you and for the full conference and today and tomorrow because I will went back to Los Angeles to have a lot of functions. You know, because then uh, in Los Angeles I'm very busy. And this time I come to fin uh, finish and also and Tucson. I met some officials from the state and also discuss our uh, and enhancing enhance uh, the relationship between China and United States and also in strengthening the relation between uh, Arizona and the state of Arizona and to the to the all the states in China. So today I'm very great honor to in, to be invited to attend your uh, conference. So it is well known that China enjoys a history of more than 5,000 years. We also cherish our rich and diverse civilization. Histor historical books and records are one of the practical carriers of the cultural heritage. Since the ancient time, we have attached great importance to the correcting Catering and citizen systemized amazing of the of this records, the time the Chinese Buddhist can, canon is the extremely important because of its rich completion and the global influence. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, more than six decades ago, the Chinese government has made great efforts to, pre to preserve the Chinese Buddhist canon. We established a special committee. We host a number of international seminars, and also we have invited scholars from the Chinese Academy of the School of Science Peking University and Research Institute of Buddhism Culture of China to continue their research. University of Arizona is famous for their research on the Oriental studies, including the Buddhist canon and Tibetan study. You have hosted a series similar and published many research papers. I commend your continued efforts to spread the Buddha's words and to promote the Chinese culture. Ladies and gentlemen, in January 2011, President Hu Jintao paid a successful state visit to the United States. In the joint, in the joint statements signed on January 19, the two sides agreed to promote people to people. Contacts and expand cultural interaction, and in the condition of in the in this condition, I hope that we will work together to promote better understanding and friend and friendship between the people of our two countries. And also, I wish this conference a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Chu. And now we have uh, Alan Philippe Duran representing School of International, uh, simply Silk, right? <laughs> Represent Silk to give us a talk, please. Thank you and uh, welcome again, everyone. Um, if it is your first time uh, in Tucson and uh, in Arizona, uh, no need to check the, the weather channel because it's always like that every day. So <laughs> this is one thing I've learned. It's my first year here at, uh, in Arizona. I just moved uh, in August. 
from uh, Rhode Island. And this is something I've uh, noticed, you know, why do they even need to have the, the weatherman, you know, because it's always beautiful weather, so it's great. Um, on behalf of uh, all our colleagues and uh, students in the School of International Languages, Literatures and Cultures, uh, Silk, I'm very happy to welcome you in Tucson. It is truly an honor for us to host such an impressive group of scholars representing universities from around the country and the world. I would like to take this opportunity to extend a special welcome to His Excellency, Mr. Chu Xiaofang, uh, the Consul General of the Chinese Consulate in Los Angeles, and to thank him for honoring us with his presence today. I would also like to thank the ACLS, the Chiang Kuo Foundation, Dean Marie Wilner Bassett of the College of the Humanities, and uh, Dr. Phil Gabriel, head of the Department of East Asian Studies, for their support. Finally, I want to express our gratitude to my colleague, Dr. Jiang Wu, uh, the organizing committee, and to Ms. Ruby Shelton and Ms. Kelly Moyes in our staff for their tireless work uh, in making this international conference possible in every aspect research, grant writing, and logistics. My best wishes to all of you for a wonderful conference and stay in our beautiful region. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Louis Lancaster. I just introduced him as a director of EKI, what we call the EKI Electronic Cultural Atlas Initiative at the UC Berkeley and also the former president of the University of the West. Right? And Lou is actually the pioneer in this field, studying Buddhist canon. Right? Back in the 70s, he was in Fangshan, right? so studying but the stone editions. Right? At that time, no foreigners actually visited the place. And we are all, when we were all using DOS system, anybody remember DOS system? <laughs> <laughs> Probably for a younger generation, they, they never heard about that. But that's the time actually Lu already started typing input all the Buddhist texts into the DOS system in Shanghai, right? And then the Korean and Taiwan people took that project and you see the result, right? So it's all derived from Lu's ideas and uh, very uh, pioneering practice in the, this field. Right? And uh, we, we have lots of to say about his digital projects, but we're not going to do that, right? So today we're going to focus on uh, Chinese Buddhist canon, and uh, Lou is going to deliver a, a keynote speech. Uh, actually, unofficially, the reason why we organized this conference, right? We, we want to study Buddhist canon, and also we want to commemorate Lou's contribution to this field. Right? Uh, and actually, I propose to dedicate our conference, conference volume to Lou Lancaster's contribution. Right? And also, we are contemplating propose a AAS panel, uh, probably jointly, by uh, scholars of Buddhist study and also scholars from digital humanities right, to give us a full picture uh, of Lu's contribution in these two fields. Right. Now it's my great pleasure right, to invite it, uh, Professor Louis Lancaster to deliver the <coughs> keynote speech, right, which is called The Changing Pattern of the Buddhist Canon Research. Please. Well, thanks for those very kind words. Not sure they're fully deserved by any means. Well, this morning I woke up and I was startled. There was this strange light. It was eerie. And I thought, what's going on? And then I realized it's sunlight. Because in the Bay Area, we have not seen the sun for three weeks. I had forgotten what sunlight is like. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here at this wonderful weather where you really have sunlight. <laughs> Thank you. What a, just a first word of appreciation to John Wu for putting together this conference. It's a, a masterful stroke on his part and to the university here for putting all this effort to bring us together. Really appreciate it, and we thank you so much. Well, it's, it's really pleasing for me to be at a conference like this. 
And here are so many papers that deal with the canons of Buddhism. Because I lived through this period in the 20th century when canonic study was rejected by many as being a focus on elitist literature and not related to social and cultural issues. I have this memory of going to a conference in Los Angeles in the early 90s when one of the scholars said to me, we don't use the word canon anymore. You need to revise your vocabulary. Um, I didn't mind. I didn't revise my vocabulary. Uh, as we know, the tides of change affect our scholarship uh, as much as they affect the oceans. Well, in this meeting, I think we, we see a new era has arrived. <clears throat> and in every paper, we have proof that the canons were integral parts of social, political, and religious life. So I'm really happy to have this chance to be with you. Works. Given what is reported in this conference and in much of the research on Chinese political life, I think today it would be indefensible to try to write histories without reference, particularly in China, to the way in which the production, the housing, and the veneration of the canons intertwined with legitimacy of rule and expression of meritorious activity. Canons played an important role in the life of people, and that was something which I really uh, fought for when people said, don't study canons. But I've tried to say that the life of people is so much affected in China by this. Tens of thousands of printing blocks have been created over the years. Millions of pages of xylograph prints have been produced and financed over the centuries throughout the dynasties of East Asia. If that's not part of social life and political life, then I don't know what we could find as a good example to study. The papers that I have had in hand before our meeting are excellent in many differing ways. From them, we can advance, I think, our understanding of the complexity of the study of canons. This complexity will be taken up in each panel and by the responders. My task has been given to me and defined as giving an overview of the research, and it's surely a daunting task to try to do that. I won't succeed. Since the papers will be discussed individually during the panels, I won't attempt here to duplicate that effort. My focus will be on how Buddhist studies can profit from these various approaches. So I want to divide my comments into a few topic areas. Zhang Wu reminds us of the previous studies of cult of the book in Indian Buddhism. This advent of a major new technology in Buddhism, which was in those days writing, the introduction of that technology in the tradition was such a major import that we are still trying to understand it. And I suggest that we should not limit our comments on writing just to the religious aspects. The big question for me with regard to this is, when did the Buddhists learn to read and write? Who were the audience for written texts? What was the process by which recitation was joined with manuscript copies? From the research going on in India today, <coughs> it appears that most that one of the most prominent literate groups was maritime merchants who required detailed records for long distance trade. It may be that maritime Buddhism holds a clue to the emergence of written texts. And if that is the case, then we need to re go back and look at where did writing in Buddhism emerge among whom and why. So we still have issues in India as well as China. Well, when Buddhism arrived in the Han Dynasty capital, it was soon made into a scribal tradition as the project of translating from Indic originals 
got underway in a major fashion by the second century. So as we know, for nearly a thousand years, the work of translation would continue, creating one of the monumental transfers of information from one cultural sphere to another. The translations have been, in many ways, the focus for the activities that included cataloging, housing, reproduction. Professor He Mei has reminded us that there are two distinct periods of early canonic development. At first, we had the manuscript age, and this was followed by the woodblock age. That is to say, the printing technology applied to canonic works. I think that the printing technology was the next big technological advent in Buddhism. Writing was the first in many ways. Printing was another one. So most of our discussion here in the conference focuses on printed canons, which became dominant in East Asia. And we have no complete set of manuscript or hand copied canons to study. They just aren't there. I've looked for them. They aren't there. I've never found them. Moro Shakya, who's here, tells us of the current state of collecting and digitizing the Sanskrit manuscripts from the Nawari uh, Buddhist of Kathmandu. <coughs> now, we're indebted to him for his work in making so much of this extant material freely available through the internet. The access to these Indic language witnesses for the canonic text is an important part of the study and understanding of the network that brought the material contained in the Chinese versions of the canon into existence. At the same time, it's important to remember that much of the translated material in East Asia came from Sanskrit or Indic texts that are no longer existing. The second century Chinese translations are our only source for the study of the formation of Indic texts from that period. The oldest texts are in Chinese, not Sanskrit. Therefore, it is time that is extant. That is time to remind scholars that the Sanskrit texts, however important they are, dating from 19th century copies, for example, are not the original source. Well, for many centuries, East Asian Chinese language canonic material was in the form of manuscripts. They were composed of varying numbers of available texts, and this content was drawn from numerous manuscript collections. The large collection of manuscripts from Dunhuang is, is, is important, as Professor Jun has described its impact. The nature of those cache of texts found in Cave 17 is still a mystery. The fact that the leaders of the European expeditions I'm going to criticize them here, went through that collection. And as they went through it and extracted items, they did not make any record at all of the way in which the scrolls were laid down. This is a great pity that they didn't do that. Archaeological practices, which are now well established, consider such activities to be destructive and to be equivalent to pillaging a site. And that's actually what Orlstein and Pelio did. They pillaged Cave 17 without leaving us any record of what they found in terms of its arrangement. So I hope that uh, we've all learned a lesson from that. <clears throat> the work of putting scanned images on the internet from Dunhuang has been one of the great accomplishments of the digital library efforts. And under the guidance of Dr. Susan Whitfield of the British Library, we can now begin a study of these thousands of scrolls in imagery that allows for careful and accurate viewing. They are to be highly commended for doing one of the best jobs of scanning that I have ever seen for such a major collection. It's excellent. So I hope to see more research being done on the manuscripts of the canon as a needed background for how we view the contents 
that were engraved on the printing blocks. It's important to realize that our work with the printed editions need not remove us totally from manuscript methodology. One of the chief opportunities that we have to reach back into the manuscript age lies in the use of the printed editions. It's worth remembering that the carving of a printing block started with pasting onto wooden blocks a thin sheet of paper containing a manuscript. So we need to see that our prints are not so distant from a manuscript, they are an image, in effect, of it. Now another example of manuscripts, as I call them, can be found in the stone slabs at Fangshan. <coughs> Since I think the incision on the stones was simply another hand copy method, that is, it was a manuscript, and it's similar to the use of a brush on paper, so that we should consider the rock cut canons basically as manuscripts. Well, even after the advent of printing, editions continue, advent of printing, Editions continue to vary. Some people feel that printing freezes the canon, but we see that that has not been the case in China. No edition is an exact copy of another. Texts were rearranged. Different texts were chosen to appear in the collections, and what I call redactions from East Asia found their way into the open canon structure. As Professor He has pointed out, the, there are many mixed editions that continue to be printed in contemporary projects in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the People's Republic of China. Editors are always on the lookout for new entries, and they all like to make a slightly different arrangement. <laughs> well, these printed editions were numerous, and we have more than 20 of these um, just to show you the complexity of what we work with. The printing blocks uh, came to us in this form, and they proliferated and proliferated. And the study of the Chinese Buddhist canon is somehow to study all of this as a unit and to understand all of this in terms of the history and the way in which the canon has been put together and developed. This is the Chinese Buddhist canon in all of its complexity, and that's not even all of it, really. <laughs> so we can characterize the printed canons as eclectic. They were composed of varying numbers of available texts, and the content for each of them was drawn from numerous manuscript collections. The tracing of the texts and the imagery associated with one deity, for example, in the paper by Professor Gemello, gives us a partial picture of how convoluted the network of sources and redactions become in the structuring of canonic materials. The role of the Kaibao edition made for manuscripts housed in Sichuan is central to the story of the woodblock age. We look forward to the comments uh, of Professor Jun and the report on the, of the latest research dealing with this version. Well, the ancient blocks of the Kaibao, of course, have disappeared. And the few rubbings that are found scattered around East Asia hardly give us an accurate picture of the version. In the early 1990s, when I was working with Professor Fujieda from, he was then at Ryukoku University, we were able to compare a known rubbing from Kaibao with ones from the Koryo blocks and the Gen Canon edition. As we looked at them, we began to notice something which you can now begin to see, I think, also. The Koryo and the Jin traced the Kaibao. Uh -huh. 
those you cannot have people writing by hand and getting that exact structure for page after page after page. Human hands don't do that. So they had traced them. Because they traced them, in a sense, the Kaibao is not lost to us. We still have it when we have a text in both the Koryo and the Jen. We can see what probably we recover, the readings from the Kaibao. So the question still remains, however, as what portion of the Goryeo edition could be considered a copy of the original Kaibao? I will tell you that I'm, I'm under great attack in Korea for what I'm about to tell you. And somebody yelled at me two months ago <laughs> that I was wrong. <laughs> so I warn you, I may be wrong. I try my best to understand that I don't think you can ever be totally right. I just try to be less wrong, so I'm not sure. Well, Professor Zawinka has explored the importance of this Goryeo edition in terms of the political atmosphere on the peninsula, and I really welcome his, his work with that. In particular, he has turned his attention to the role of defending the nation as one aspect of the construction of the canon. Well, in some of my own recent research, using computational analysis, the software produced a graph for me at one point, which showed that the Goryeo divides itself into five distinct segments. When I began to review these five distinct segments, <coughs> segment one, which is the best hope for having the original Kaibao, covers <coughs> material that was translated or redacted prior to 730. At 730, segment one ends. Segment two suddenly interrupts the flow. Uh, and instead of continuing with the translations and redactions after 730, we suddenly find ourselves introduced to translations that were being made in the northern Sung and therefore not available when the Kaibao blocks were carved. Suddenly, we're in Northern Song. We've skipped. So it was obvious that people said, hey, we're missing text. What about the text from 730 up to the translation for the uh, other? And so segment three came along, and it filled in this problem. It's a supplement of translations and redactions made between 730 and the cessation of translation work, which occurred in the Tang for a period of almost 200 years. Not a single text was translated. So then we come to segment four, and it again returns us to the Northern Sung. Now they're showing us their new set of translations that made up to 1072, which is the, really the end of the great period of translation that created our Chinese Buddhist canon translations. Segment five is a miscellaneous collection of redactions and a few translations not contained in the previous four divisions. This tells us that the Goryeo canon as it now stands is arranged by order of acquisition, not by order of translation or composition. It is basically a librarian's approach of shelving material as they arrive, rather than sorting them by subject or time. Well, the typographical age arrived with the movable type editions. <clears throat> All right, I got one slide out of order. And as we will hear from Professor Wilkinson, the Taisho and the Showa, and it's interesting, we only refer to it as Taisho, 
But of course, the volumes included in, in the so-called Taisho are both Taisho and Showa Arab texts. The Taisho and Showa edition of the first part of 20th century certainly was preeminent. Most of us started and still continue to do our research using this edition, making it our standard citation. You always go back and do T dot, you know, we have to do this. It was in many ways a great accomplishment and its place in history, I think, is fully established. Whatever we say about the Taisho, it was very successful. Well, as we hear from, as we hear this eclectic edition, the Taisho is an eclectic edition, was made available the readings of the Goryeo, as well as notations from other editions. But there's issues which deserve our consideration. We now know that the typesetters in Tokyo had a set of 10,000 characters in their font set. That was it. <laughs> so when they saw an ancient character in their Koryo edition, they had to scratch their heads and say, hmm, which character do we choose? We don't have that character in our font set. So those typesetters in that little room at the printers made the decision about which character in their available set would substitute for the one they were looking at in the Goryeo edition. We scholars have for a long time made use of readings where the decision was made not by scholars, but by typesetters. <laughs> they were good, and they probably made as good a decision as scholars would have made. But I think that now that we have the ability to go back and look at the original choreo, it is important at, that we take a look at that to make sure that we agree with the Tokyo typesetters that that character should be there. Well, um, the other problem that we face with the Taisho is it has its famous footnotes. And we have all depended and used those footnotes throughout time. But there are a lot of problems with the footnotes. Uh, there was not one Sung edition. There were multiple Sung editions. Which one do you mean when you put Sung? When you say Ming, which Ming do you mean? When you put the character for three and says it's Sung Ming Yuan, it tells me nothing in a way. I don't know where they got, which ones of all those that they were actually using. Well, the notations of the Jin Canon facsimile edition, which was published in Beijing, is a real improvement over Taisho notes. And if you want to look at notes, you use that edition rather than the Taisho notes for sure. And that's because in that, they make specific references to the actual text in the Sung and the actual text in the Ming and the Fangshan text that they were looking at. So those footnotes have taken us a great leap forward. Um, so we're very privileged here and fortunate to have a, a detailed paper, for example, on the colophons of the Ming edition and by Professor Long. And he has looked carefully at the colophons of the Ming edition as a method of identifying the major players in the history of that set. And it is certainly uh, good to have that kind of study. We have nothing similar with all the people who have studied the Ming up to now. With the Jisha Zhang, we have the careful study by Professor Jai. Uh, I think that paper is almost takes us as far as we probably can go in terms of what's available and known about that edition. It's a great contribution. The very interesting and little research uh, Jia Xing Zhang has been explored by Professor Jamello in terms of using esoteric texts to show how this collection was influenced by changing patterns in late imperial China. But we also have to look at this as being 
in a sense, the people's canon. This was a project of almost 90 years to complete it, required them to go out and secure support from ordinary people. This was not a government project. And so we're very interested to know much more about that one. It deserves the study that it's getting. And I'm really pleased to see that that study begins at this conference. Well, the work of recording alternate readings is still incomplete because quoted passages from the canon occur in dynastic histories, local gazetteers, steely inscriptions, and the reactions. The canon is quoted throughout the literature, and these sources have hardly been touched. Who goes to look in the Sikukonshu to see where various parts of the Chinese Buddhist canon have been quoted, and are those quotes the same readings that we see in the standard editions, or were they locals? So I think that the other also is the fact that we have thousands of fragments of manuscripts that have been found in the archeological digs of Central Asia and parts of China. These fragments are hard to work with, I mean, they're just debris almost. And yet, uh, in many cases, these ancient fragments are the oldest examples that we have for the text. We need to use those fragments to the degree that we can. And now that we have the digital search available, even a very small fragment can often be identified and identified quickly. When we have these fragments identified, then we need to reconstruct the text as best we can from those fragments to see if from these very ancient materials we can have a new reading. Well, cataloging issues loom large in our study of the canon. Professor Storch and Professor He May address some of the unresolved questions, and I, I welcome all of that. We also have with us Professor Phil Stanley, who is the leader of the large project housed at Bangkok to create a union catalog of all Buddhist texts. Muro Shakya is also a member of that cataloging pro project and he heads up the Sanskrit team. Professor Amingdu, who's here in the team at Cbeta, are also constantly involved in matters pertaining to cataloging. It is exciting for me to have this array of researchers braining forward the discussion of cataloging and how we do it and what we are, how we can make a strategy for ourselves. Well, in terms of cataloging, I've used the word redaction. If you think of a better word, I'm happy to accept it. I use the word redaction for the authored and anonymous text produced in East Asia. As we see in the segments of the Choreo block prints, there was a clear divide between redactions and translations. In the catalog of 22 versions of the canon by Professor Tung, we note that more than half of the 4,175 listings are in fact redactions. These are listed with this, these categories, commentaries, compilations, annotations, and recorded sayings of masters. This is the way the colophones have identified these sorts of redactions. But in addition to these four types of redactions, scholars have long noted that among the translations there are anomalies. These question texts, now referred to as apocryphal, are in many ways simply a fifth division of the redaction since they exhibit many of the same characteristics of word use as the compilations. Using computational analysis with the occurrence of words, we can now see more clearly that certain texts have the same uh, profile. And I've been working with the uh, word that usually means original enlightenment, and I look for the profile of the use of this word. And you can see the use of it here over time. There's an anomaly. 
The early occurrence of hundreds of examples in a text that claims to be in the third century is an anomalous thing. We do not find anything comparable until the later compilations. That tells us that that text was probably has the characteristics of a compilation, not a translation. It is the Vajra Samadhi Sutra that is referred to here. So I had great fun showing this to Robert Buzlow since he did his dissertation on it. And he moaned because he said, well, that's, that's a great pity because I spent uh, two years trying to find out why it was anomalous. <laughs> and here the software is beginning to produce things. I show it in a few moments. I think that it will be helpful if we can finally catalog with some assurance the redactions that are now characterized as translations. That's all apocryphal text really means. It's a compilation, but it's put as a translation, period. So if we want to understand these apocryphal texts, the place to look is in the redactions because it belongs in the list of redactions. We won't find it so much in the sutra translations. We're going to find it in these redactions. So we have three papers from Professor Welter, Levering, and Pocheski that give thoughtful appraisal of, I can't go back for some reason. This will not take me back. Right, yeah, it does. All right, um, somehow I had, yeah. The Chan redactions. We have papers about the Chan. Many people are very interested in these Chan redactions which came into East Asia. So it is from the Chan that we have a large number of redactions, especially those indexed as recorded sayings. These are the primary Chan text. So for a Chan study of the future, just as with the apocryphal study, I think it's important for us to begin to fully understand the redactions because that's where they belong. And that if we begin to study redactions as a genre, then we can see how the patterns of the format and the uses of vocabulary take shape in these East Asian documents. So our study of redactions is, I believe, essential to outlining the history of Buddhist thought in East Asia. It's essential for us to do this. Well, we're now in the process of moving from the typ typographical age to the digital age. Let me just catch up with myself here. <clears throat> Professor Aming Du gives us an account of C-beta and the way in which the site has developed. There can be no doubt that Sibeta has been the major change agent in Buddhist studies at the end of the 20th century for Chinese Buddhist studies. It is impossible to express fully, I think, our appreciation to all of the staff at Fago Buddhist College for the contribution they make every day to hundreds of scholars who access the canon through their portal. So, Professor Du, uh, we, we really thank you, and I'm glad that you're here. Professor Du has been a major contributor to that process. I've been visiting and going there for all these years, and I have watched the work that he has personally done. I want to acknowledge this group, the, the impact he has made on our study of the canon. It would be inappropriate in today's world to have a conference on the Chinese Buddhist canon without a recognition of this digital component. That's how far we've come into the digital age. Well, there's still much to be done in the digital arena for canonic studies. Search and retrieval has dominated our scholarly workflow, but I think the computer can take us much further into analysis and computation. I have tried to explore the edges of this approach by working with ways in which Transfer of natural language text into imagery can allow us to see patterns of occurrence more rapidly and efficiently. I'm working with a whole team of people, including Howie Lan at Berkeley, John Lee, Sarah Kinderdine, Jonathan Webster at City University of Hong Kong, the support of the Korean digital projects. 
And we're now able to make progress in a virtual reality lab setting. Um, what we're now able to do is to uh, walk through the cannon. I'm walking through the cannon here. This is me. You can hardly see me. I'm in there. Uh, each character is turned into a dot. The dot can contain the actual character, if you wish it. For the first time, I am able, in that environment, a 360-degree theater, to look at more than 100 pages of the canon at one time. I just have to turn my head, and there it is. If I'm looking for the patterns of the occurrence of my word in those 100 pages, I quickly will see them. If I want to read it, I can bring up a six-foot-high virtual reality full text for what I'm working with. What we are planning to do is to, in April, I'm going over to work on it, we're going to put four uh, Buddhist scholars in the same place, and we are all going to do this search together. And for the first time, we will have four scholars who have the same experience that we normally have as a personal experience in front of our computer screen in our study and nobody is there with us to look at it at the same moment. We will all be in this environment trying to look at it. So I hope that this computation opens up a new vista to chart the history of words, to search for multiple words at one time, to view 100 or more pages at once in a 3D environment, and to display a range of results in graphic format. Well, I want to thank uh, John Wu again and his staff so much for bringing us together, for providing the necessary support to allow our meeting to proceed. The work that all of you are doing is essential to our field, and we must strive to make sure that the information from this conference is widely distributed. Thank you. Thank you.